Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you all for joining us at another uh, DIMAP seminar. So it's my, it's my great pleasure to introduce Vera Traub from ETH Zurich. Uh, today, uh, Vera is a postdoc at ETH Zurich and uh, she recently completed her PhD from the University of Bonn. Uh, Vera already has a very rich uh, track record of uh, fantastic contributions to uh, routing and connectivity augmentation. Uh, her PhD thesis was awarded uh, the EATCS uh, Distinguished Dissertation Award last year, as well as it won a uh, House of Memorial Prize. And uh, Vera is here to tell us about some recent exciting work that, appeared at, that appears at Fox this year on better than two approximations for weighted tree augmentation. So Vera, welcome to Warwick and well, virtually, and uh, whenever you're ready, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the kind of introduction and also like for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so today I want to tell you about some recent results on weighted tree augmentation. There is some joint work uh, together with Recruits Inclusion, who is also at ETH. And just one thing to say before you start, if you have any questions in between, um, if anything is unclear during the talk, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm happy to answer questions uh, during the talk also. Okay, so let's get started uh, with the problem definition. So what is weighted tree augmentation about? Uh, so the, the task in weighted tree augmentation is we are given some, some tree, G with vertices and edges, as you can see it here in black on the picture on the left. And then we are also given some extra edges. Uh, these are these orange dashed edges here, and we will call these edges links in order to distinguish them from the edges of the tree G. And these links come together with weights that are given by this non-negative weight function W here. And so our goal in weighted tree augmentation is to find the minimum weight subset of these links such that when we add these links to this tree G, then we obtain a two edge connected graph. So an example would be, we could, for example, pick those four orange links here. And if we add those to the tree G, then we obtain a two edge connected graph. Uh, so this would be a feasible solution. Just one remark about this problem here, it might seem very special to assume that this given graph G here is a tree, but in fact, we could equivalently just say, just require G to be any arbitrary connected graph. And this problem would be equivalent because as our, in our goal is, we call it our goal is to obtain a two edge connected graph and just by adding some additional links. So if you have any arbitrary connected graph G, we can just upfront contract all the two edge connected component of these, of this graph. This maintains an equivalent instance, but now after this contraction of the two edge connected components, our graph is actually a tree. So this problem, while I'm only talking about augmenting a tree uh, to a two edge connected graph, this really catches augmenting any connected graph to a two edge connected graph. Okay, so this is the problem uh, we want to talk about today. And this is in this problem is like APX hard, even like in the most simple simple special cases you can think of, like even if all the links have unit weights and the tree has like constant diameter, and then the problem is still APX hard. Uh, so we'll talk about approximation algorithms here today. And when talking about such algorithms, it's often useful to view this weighted tree augmentation problem in a slightly different way, namely as a covering problem. And so let me explain what I mean by this. Well, okay, so just recall that our goal is to obtain a two edge connected graph. So this basically means we should ensure that every cut in this graph contains at least two edges. And because we are already having this tree G here, this really means all the edges that all the cuts that we need to care about are those cuts that contain just a single edge of the tree G. So I could also equivalently say in weighted tree augmentation, I want to cover all these one cuts of this tree G here by these orange links. So if I now say a link, then in this view covers precisely those edges that are contained in the path between its endpoint. So here in this example, this I would say this, this blue link here covers all the one cuts or all the edges that are on this green path PL here, then I can for you define weighted tree augmentation 
equivalently as the covering, pro covering problem, where I say every edge of this tree G here should be covered one link, should be covered by one of the links in my solution, where link covers precisely those edges on this green pass PL here in the picture. So this is uh, just the same problem, but phrasing this as a covering problem, which is typically useful when we talk about algorithms for W tab. Okay, um, so this is the problem definition. And as the title of the talk suggests, I want to talk about better than two approximations in this talk today. But as a warm up, let us first see why it is easy to get the true approximation. And this will also be, this algorithm will also be useful later on. So there are like very many different ways of uh, obtaining a true approximation for weighted tree augmentation. Let me show you one such way. So here, so the first step of this true approximation algorithm is that we pick an arbitrary root, root vertex of our tree G. Uh, so like this vertex R here on top. And then the second step will be to split every link into two links that are, have the property that they are so-called uplinks. So what do I mean by this? Well, here in this right picture, all the links are uplinks, which just means that, for example, for this brown link here, one endpoint of the link, namely this one here, is an ancestor of the other endpoint in this tree here. And like the same holds for any link here in this right picture. And we always have the property that one endpoint of the link is an ancestor of the other endpoint. And this is what we call an uplink. So now one can observe that one can always split every link like the link here every arbitrary link like the like this red link here on the left in two uplinks uh, like these red ones here in the right picture uh, such that the the edges that are covered by these two uplinks here on the right picture are exactly the same edges as those covered by the red link on the left so you can always just Place every link here by two uplinks um, such that these two uplinks cover exactly the same thing as the original link covered. And I will just give those uh, links the same weight as the original link. Because I split every link into at most two uplinks, well, the, the cost of an optimum solution has increased at most by a factor two. And so now, why do I do all this? So, why do I want to have uplinks? Well, the reason for this is simply that if I have only uplinks in my instance, then the problem suddenly becomes polynomial time solvable. So if I have weighted tree augmentation with uplinks only, that's polynomial time solvable. There are many different ways of doing this. One way would be to solve the natural LP relaxation. Um, this is integral if we have only uplinks. Or another way would also be to use some dynamic programming algorithm bottom up over the tree. This way, one could also achieve an optimal solution. And then if I have this uh, optimal solution here, this will have weighted most twice and the optimal solution for the original instance. And I can just obtain a solution for the original instance by replacing every link uh, by the original link from which it uh, arose. Uh, because these uplinks here, they always cover only less than what the original thing link does. This replacement will still maintain a feasible solution, so we get a true approximation. So this is one of many different ways of how one can get a true approximation for weighted tree augmentation. In terms of algorithms that achieve approximation ratios better than two, um, no such for the general problem, no such algorithm was known um, before the work that I want to talk about today. Um, but still, special cases have been studied a lot. So in particular, there was a lot of work on unweighted tree augmentation. So we all weights have the same link. It was also some, they, uh, some of these results also allow for slightly more general cost functions, but not for general weights. And then there was one important result uh, by Cohen and Nutov. Um, they showed that, they, that there is a 1 plus L and 2 approximation algorithm if the tree um, has constant diameter. Um, this result is quite important because one of the algorithms I want to talk about today can be seen as a generalization of the algorithm to trees of general diameter. And then there is a third special case um, where better than two approximations were known, and this is when an optimal solution to a natural appeal relaxation has no small fractional values. 
So these are like special cases uh, where better than two approximations were known previously. Um, today I want to talk about um, this result here, namely that there is a 1 plus 1.5 plus epsilon approximation algorithm for weighted tree augmentation for any fixed positive epsilon. And so the plan for this talk is going to be I first want to show you the most simple way I know of how we can beat the factor two. This is by a so-called relative greedy algorithm. The approximation ratio of this algorithm is a bit less than 1.7. And then I want to show you a more refined algorithm, which is using some local search technique and achieves actually this approximation ratio of 3f plus epsilon. And then depending on the time, if I still have time for it, I will also talk a bit more about the main technical ingredient that we need to prove uh, the approximation ratios of actually both of these algorithms, which is a certain kind of decomposition theorem, but I'll come to that later. Okay, um, so let me get started with this relative greedy algorithm. So in general, in general, relative greedy algorithms is a technique that you might have seen also for other, uh, for as approximation algorithms for other problems than just like by the tree augmentation. So for example, one example is Zelikovsky's algorithm for the standard tree problem. This is also such a relative greedy algorithm. And so the general idea in such a relative greedy algorithm is that we start with some highly structured um, initial solution that has often a rather weak approximation guarantee. And then in the course of the algorithm, we start, we repeatedly start, uh, replace parts of our original starting solution by better components that are in some sense cheaper and thus improve our solution over the course of the algorithm. And so let me make this a bit more concrete um, at the example of this weighted tree augmentation. So here, uh, let us first talk about how we are, what, what is going to be the starting solution of our algorithm that is going to be only a true approximation, but we'll improve on this later. And so initially, we start by computing an optimal uplink solution, uh, which is a true approximation. So this is just a simple true approximation algorithm I've shown you just a minute ago. And now this is not yet structured enough for our purposes. Um, we want to have more structure, namely we want that not only every edge is of the tree is covered by at least one of the links in our solution, which is always the case in the feasible solution, but we want that every edge is covered by exactly one of the uplinks. And so here in the left picture you see this brown edge here is covered by both of the two green uplinks. And so what we do in order to avoid this is we basically shorten one of these green uplinks by moving its endpoint along this brown edge. Um, we can always like make a link shorter in that way. This is always feasible because we just replace the link by a weaker one that just covered, covers less. So this, this is something we can always do. And it turns out that if we have only uplinks in our solution, it is always possible to shorten links in such a way that every edge of the tree is covered by exactly one of the uplinks. So this is going to be our very structured um, initial solution. It's only a true approximation, which is rather weak, but we have the property that the solution consists only of uplinks and every edge of the tree is covered by exactly one of these uplinks in Q. So this is the starting solution. And so starting with this, um, we can now get to our relative greedy algorithm. In this algorithm, we will always maintain a feasible solution to our problem, which I write as u union f. The set u here will always maintain, contain only uplinks, whereas the set f here will be, can contain any arbitrary links. And so initially, we just set u to be this highly structured solution consisting only of uplinks and where every edge is covered by exactly one of the uplinks. And f is initially empty. So this is the starting solution. And then uh, the algorithm does the following. So as long as the rate of my solution decreases, so as long as I make progress, I will repeatedly do the following. So first I select some component C. I will tell you in a minute how, how to select this. So C could be, it's just, a, just think of C as just being some set of links. For example, these two green links here in the picture. 
Then I will add this component to my solution because C can contain arbitrary links, so I will add it to the set F. And then, of course, if I add these components, well, some of these uplinks in U might become redundant. Maybe I don't need them anymore. So I want to remove those. And so in this example here, these are those two red links here. They become redundant. We don't need them anymore. And we call these, these links that we that become redundant that we can drop some from our solution. We call this the drop set of the component. And this contains precisely those uplinks in U that become redundant because everything that is covered by this by by these red uplinks is also covered by the component C. So I clearly don't need them anymore if I add the component C. So this is the drop set. This this is the I can remove those links uh, from my solution. And then I just repeat this as long as the weight of my solution decreases. And in the end, I return my solution if I don't make any progress anymore. Good. Uh, so this is the algorithm. The only thing I haven't shown you yet is how do we compute select this component C here. And the way we choose C is that we choose, will always choose C among some restricted class of components that I'm going to define in a minute. And among this restricted class of components, I choose the component in such a way that it minimizes the ratio between the weight of the component, so the weight of what I add to my solution, uh, divided by the weight of the drop set, so the weight of the stuff I remove uh, from my solution. So in, in some sense, I'm minimizing locally the ratio between the stuff I, I exchange. So I, I add the component C and I remove the drop and I want to minimize the ratio between the weights here. So this is just actually a very generic description. Most relative greedy algorithms work in such a way. One important question here is always, how do we choose this restricted class of components that we are allowed to add in there? And so let us now think a little bit about how we should choose these comp this class of components here and what properties this class of components should have. So first of all, we clearly, in order to be able to implement the algorithm at all in efficiently, we should be able to efficiently find a component that minimizes this ratio here between the weight of the component and the weight of the drop. So this is the one thing we need in order to get a polynomial runtime. And then second, of course, we also want that our algorithm is actually good. So this means if we start only with a true approximation, there should actually be exist some component that we can use to make progress. Um, so the second property that we need in order to achieve a good approximation ratio that is better than two is this property B here. This says that if the weight of the remaining uplinks, so the weight of U, is still much larger than the weight of opt, so the weight of an optimal solution, then there should exist a component that I can use to make progress. So where the weight of the component, so the weight of what I add, um, is significantly less than the weight of the drop, so the weight of what I can remove. If I have this property, um, it should, yeah, it is not hard to see that we at least get some approximation ratio that is better than two, because if, the, if initially u is really only a two approximation, um, then until I replace the large part of u by better components, there will always be a component that I can trade um, and while making a lot of progress, basically, making things a lot cheaper by a large factor. So these are the two properties that we need. Now the question is, what should be the right class of uh, components? And one red, very natural choice uh, that was already, already used by Cohen and Nutov for these trees of constant diameter was that they considered components that were just constant size link sets. And this is kind of convenient because, you know, property A is like very trivial. We can just enumerate over all components to find the best one. Unfortunately, if we have for general weighted tree augmentation, if we only allow constant size link sets as components, and this relative greedy algorithm does not give a better than two approximation. So there are really examples showing this. So property B is not fulfilled. So we need something more general. Now, in the like natural class of components, which is 
also good to look at is we could maybe allow just arbitrary link sets. Um, if you allow arbitrary link sets, property B is fulfilled because we could just always use as a component just the optimal solution. In this case, we could always drop all of U and so property B is sort of trivially fulfilled. There always exists a good component, namely the optimal solution. Of course, it now kind of seems elusive to find this uh, optimal component. This might be up. We're probably not going to be able to do this. So property A will most likely fail. Uh, so now the question is, is there any good class of components somewhere in between? This class of components should be general enough such that it actually, that, they all, that it contains always good components that we can use to make progress in our algorithm. But on the other hand, this class should also be restricted enough or should have enough structure such that we can efficiently find the best component to pick next in our algorithm. And it turns out that uh, such a good class of component exists, namely the class of so-called k-thin link sets. And so let me now define this class of components. Um, so here is like the formal definition. Um, it says that a set of links uh, C is k thin if for every vertex in a tree, there are at most k links for which the vertex lies on this path PL. So let me maybe go over this definition in this example here on the right. So I claim that these three orange links here form a too thin component. And what we need to check there is we need to look at every vertex B in the tree, for example, this blue one here. And now for this thick orange link here, the vertex V lies on this path PL between the endpoints of the link. For the second link here, this thick one here, again, V lies on this path. But for the third one, V does not lie on this path here. So there are only two links uh, for which V lies on this path. And if you, you can go over all the vertices and check, we will always lie only on, on most two of these paths. And this is why we call this component a too thin component. And we'll consider in our algorithm k thin components for some constant k um, that depends on some epsilon that later appears in our approximation guarantee. OK, so this is the formal definition. Now let's see why these k-thin components fulfill these two properties A and B that I mentioned on the previous slide. So first of all, we should show that we, are, we can efficiently find the component C, minimizing this ratio here. And it turns out that this can be done by some dynamic program bottom up over the tree. Um, I will not explain the details here because this is like really a pretty standard and straightforward dynamic program bottom up over the tree. Um, so really, like this definition of case thinness is made up in such a way that the straightforward or standard dynamic program bottom over the tree, up over the tree has polynomial runtime. Um, okay, but this is like uh, not too interesting. So let me skip this part in this talk here. And what I talk about the second property, this property B here, because this is the much more interesting part. Namely, here we should show that there always exists a good component that we can use to make progress whenever we need it. And to show this, um, we prove a statement which we call the decomposition theorem. And so let me now show you the decomposition theorem on the next slide, and then I will show you how this implies this property B. So here is the decomposition theorem. So the setup is the following. We have some constant, a positive constant epsilon that appears on the approximation guarantee later on. And then U is this set of uplinks um, where every edge of the tree is covered by at most uh, one of these links in U. Uh, so these are these blue links here in the picture. Now the decomposition theorem says the following. It says, that there exists a partition of the optimal solution into one of our epsilon thin components such that we have the following lower bound on the sum of the weights of the drops of these components. Um, so just uh, yeah, one comment on this. So let's think about like if I think of partitioning uh, 
the optimum solution into some components. So like the best thing I could possibly hope for is essentially that every uplink in U is contained in one of these drop sets here. And so this would imply that if I, if I sum over all the components, the weights of the drops here, then this would be lower bounded by the weight of U. This would mean like every uplink in U is contained in one of these drop sets here. The decomposition theorem now tells us we cannot quite achieve this, but almost. So up to in one minus epsilon factor, I can essentially achieve that every uplink in U is contained in one of these drop sets. So that's what we prove. Well, I mean, here we stated it in terms of weights, but really like, yeah, that's what we show that. So all but an epsilon fraction of the uplinks can be contained in one of these drop sets. So this is the decomposition theorem. Let me now show you why this immediately implies the property B that we want to have. So here is again the decomposition theorem. I just copied it from the uh, previous slide. And here's the proof of property B. This is really short and fits on this slide. So here, what we wanted to show is that if the weight of U is significantly larger than the weight of R, that's the assumption in property B, so let's plug that in into the decomposition theorem. Let's plug it in here. Um, what we get is that the sum of the weights of the drops is lower bounded essentially by the weight of an optimum solution. But the weight of an optimum solution is nothing but the weight of the sum of the weights of the components because these components form a partition of R. So what we have here now is that summing up over all the components the weight of the drop is significantly larger than the weight of the component. This means for at least one of these components, the weight of the component will be significantly less than the weight of the drop. So we do have such an improving component. And this essentially proves this property B here. And if we now calculates, like makes quantifies the progress we make here, uh, one can show that this relative greedy algorithm has an approximation ratio of slightly less than uh, 1.7. So this is the relative greedy algorithm. If there are any questions about this, um, this might be a good moment to ask. Otherwise, I would continue to the local search. Hi, uh, can hey. I ask a question? Sure. So just looking at these inequalities, why don't you get one plus epsilon approximation? Uh, instead of taking one plus two? Um, well, the point is basically that U always contains only the uplinks from our initial solution. So as soon as I, I kind of replace some part, if I add one component in the first step of my algorithm, this component will not be added to the set U, um, but only, I will, so I will keep that until the very end. So basically this means initially this, this, this thing here is this estimate is really good and I'm making a lot of progress. Essentially at the beginning, I can replace some part of my solution by something that has just half the cost. But over time, until when I keep replacing some parts of U more and more, at some point after you replaced half of U, um, I basically stop making progress. So the progress, the, the, this, this ratio here is getting lower and lower over time because I can only win uplinks in you basically i see thanks yeah Good. okay good uh yeah then let's continue with the local search algorithm which can in some sense be seen as a refinement of this relative greedy algorithm and it actually addresses exactly that problem that we were just talking about Namely, in this relative greedy algorithm, we always replace only uplinks from the starting solution. If I added some link in some previous iteration, I will never remove it, even if it becomes redundant at some point. And now the very high level idea of this local search algorithm is that it would actually be nice if we could also gain on those links that we added in previous iterations. Maybe they can also become redundant and we can win something by removing them. The issue with that is that these links, they are no uplinks, so they can be arbitrary links. So a link added in some early iteration could look like this link here on the left. It can be an arbitrary link. This is no uplink, 
And like this, really this decomposition theorem that is key in the analysis of this relative greedy, that only tells us, helps us to analyze how we can win against uplinks. For these arbitrary ones, we don't really know how to analyze when we can remove them and so on. And so now the idea of this relative greedy, uh, of this local search algorithm, in this, we basically think of every link that we, such an arbitrary link that we added in some early iteration, basically we think of splitting this link into two uplinks like here on the right. So think of like this link here on the left, sort of as the union of these two uplinks here on the right. And these two uplinks just cover the same edges as this original link. This is just the same thing trick that we did already at the very beginning in this two approximation. And so the idea is I think of this link here as these two uplinks here. I will call these two uplinks the witness set of the link. And then through my decomposition theorem, I'm hopefully able to kind of analyze when I could remove one of these two halves here, so one of these uplinks in the witness set. And as soon as I got rid of both of these uplinks in my witness set, I know that I can actually also remove the original link. So as soon as I covered both halves of this link L here, I know that I can remove it. And so one thing that is important here is that somehow when we do perform our algorithm, we should somehow see some progress, even, I mean, my solution only gets cheaper once I'm really able to remove the link L here, but I should somehow also reward it if I make some partial progress. So if I get rid only of one of the two halves of these uplink, uh, uh, half of these link L here, so of one of the uplinks in the witness set here. So this is something that we need to address in the algorithm. So this was just like a very rough high level idea. And uh, let's make this a bit more concrete. Let's see what's actually going on in the algorithm. So in this uh, local search algorithm, we always maintain a feasible solution F to our problem. This is what you can see here on the left. And then we also maintain always the corresponding uplink solution. This is what you can see on the right, where we split every link into these two um, uplinks, as I've shown to you on the right picture. So this uplink solution is just the union of the witness sets of the links on the left. And then if at some point um, I add a new component, then whenever this new component uh, covers some uplinks in the solution on the right, I'm going to remove them. Uh, one technicality that I should mention here is that we always like shorten these uplinks here on the right to make sure that every edge is covered by and exactly one uplink, but this is just the technicality in order to be able to apply the decomposition theorem in the analysis. This is not important. Okay, so if I add a new component, I, I can analyze uplinks here. I remove uplinks here on the right if they become redundant. And then on the left, I remove a link as soon as both of, as soon as its witness set becomes empty. So basically as soon as both of its halves, so both of these two corresponding uplinks disappeared from the right picture. And then, because in order to reward sort of partial progress, so covering only a single uplink here uh, on the right, I'm not going to minimize uh, just like the original cost function, but I'm going to minimize a certain potential function. And uh, this is the potential function I've written down here. Uh, so let's we first pose the definition together. So what this does is first we sum up over we sum over all the links. Um, in my solution F, for which the corresponding witness set just contains a single element, like, for example, this orange link here on the left, corresponding witness set has only one element, then I sum, simply sum up the weight of the link. And then I sum also over all the links for which the witness set has two elements, and I sum up three half times the weight of the link. So this is the definition of the potential. Let us now understand, try to understand what this potential function actually does. So you just wrote again the potential function and we have the our, our W tab solution and the corresponding uplink solution on the right. So now what happens if I add a new link to my solution F? And well then the potential function will increase by at most three half times the weight of the link. This is the worst thing that can happen if the witness set, corresponding witness set uh, contains two elements. 
And now, of course, we also would like to analyze uh, what happens uh, when we we when we cover one of the uplinks in my solution U. So when I get rid of one of my uplinks, and then the potential is gonna decrease. And now the, there are two different cases. Um, the first case is if the if U is the only set element of the witness set WL. In that case, after I remove the uplink U from the uplink solution, and the link L will disappear from my solution, I'm going to remove it from F. So the potential is going to decrease uh, by the weight of the link, basically because L disappears here from this sum here on the left. And the other case is if the if you, if the if U was not the only element of the witness set, um, because this witness set contained two elements. In that case, the size of the witness set WL decreases from two to one. So instead of, so L will not appear here anymore in the right sum, but it will only appear in the left sum. So the potential decreases by half the weight of the link. Okay. And now one nice observation is that if you look at what this weight function W bar here actually does, then you can see like essentially what this does is it just spreads the weight of the link among the elements of its witness set. So if the witness set just contains one element, this will have this weight weight of L. If the witness set contains two elements, each of the elements will get half the weight. So for this reason, if I look at the total weight, W bar weight of the of my uplink solution U, this is just the same as the weight of F. And so this is actually like no coincidence. Uh, so this potential function is really made up to make sure that whenever we remove an uplink, the potential increases by the W bar weight of U, and this, the total W bar weight of all the uplinks is exactly the weight of F. So this is how the potential function is constructed. Okay, so now I claim that if I uh, look at, if I basically look at some local minimum with respect to this potential, so some 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 solution f where I cannot further decrease the potential function by adding a new component and removing the the drop from my uplink solution, then I actually have a three half approximation essentially, or three half plus epsilon approximation. And let me show you the proof because this is again actually fairly simple and it really fits again on one slide. Um, so here's the proof. Um, so essentially what you just observed on the previous slide is that whenever we add a component to our solution F, then the potential will increase by at most three half times the weight of the component. And then of course, we will also remove the, code, the, the drop of the component from our uplink solution and the potential will decrease by at least the W bar weight of the drop. That's what we observed in the previous slide. Now, of course, in our analysis, um, we will, of course, again, use the decomposition theorem. Um, so I've copied that in here again. This again said, let me just repeat this, that there exists a partition of the optimal solution into one of the epsilon thin components, such that if I sum up over all components, the W bar weight of the drop is lower bounded by one minus epsilon times the W bar weight of U, which is by this observation on the previous slide that this W bar function just spreads the weight of, 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 of a link over the elements of a witness set. This is nothing but uh, one minus epsilon times the weight of my current solution F. Okay, and so now combining these two ingredients, we immediately get what we want because suppose my current solution F is not a three half approximation, but it's much more expensive. So it's much more expensive than three half times the weight of an optimal solution. Then let's plug this, take this inequality and plug it into the decomposition theorem. What we get from this is that the sum of the W bar weights of the drops is lower bounded by three half times the weight of opt. This is coming from over here. But three half times the weight of opt is nothing but uh, but three half times the times the weights of all the components because we'll be again using that these components are a partition of opt. 
Okay, and so let's let's look at what we got here. Well, basically, we in this inequality, we sum over all the components, and on the left side, we have w bar rate of the drop. But this is precisely the potential decrease. And on the right side, we have 3 half times the rate of the component, but this is precisely the potential increase. So what this inequality here really says is that summing up over all the component, the potential decrease will be larger than the potential increase. So this means there exists a component that we can use to further decrease the potential, so there exists an improving component, and we are actually not in a local optimum. And this is actually the full proof of the approximation ratio here. So this shows that the following local search algorithm is the 3 half plus epsilon approximation. So we can now just start in this local search algorithm. We can actually start with an arbitrary W tab solution, F. So what you can see here in the top. And we always maintain the corresponding uplink solution, U. And then the local search algorithm does the following. Well, as long as the potential improves significantly, we first we pick some component that maximizes this expression here. So this expression is really just like the, the amount by which we expect the potential to decrease. So we basically choose a component that maximizes the amount by which the potential decreases. Um, to find this component, one can again use um, some dynamic program bottom up over the tree. This is like really the same dynamic program that one could use uh, for this relative greedy algorithm. So this can be done in polynomial time. Um, so we pick this component that we expect to decrease the potential by as much as possible. Then we are going to remove the drop of this component here from our uplink solution U. And if some witness set becomes empty, we of the witness set of some link L becomes empty, then we remove the link also from the solution F. Um, then, of course, we add the component to our solution and add the corresponding witness sets to the uplink solution U. And then in Udi, just for the technical reasons, in order to be able to apply the decomposition theorem, we shorten uplinks if necessary um, to make sure that every edge is covered by at most one link in this uh, uplink solution U. And we just couldn't iterate this as long as the potential decreases. In the end, we return the solution. And so basically, what I've what I shown you on the previous slide, this local search algorithm is a 1.5 plus epsilon approximation algorithm for weighted tree augmentation. Good. Uh, so this is the local search algorithm. Um, I would now spend the remaining time to talk a bit about the decomposition theorem, which was the heart of the really the analysis of both of the two algorithms, unless there are any questions about the local search algorithms, that might again be a, a good moment to ask about this. Okay, then let me talk a little bit about how we prove this decomposition theorem. So here's again the decomposition theorem. So the setting was that we have to set u of uplinks where every edge of the tree is covered by at most one of the uplinks. We have this optimal solution. This orange, what did I draw here in orange in the picture? This is opt. And then we have some constant epsilon that appears in our approximation guarantee. And our goal will be to find k thin components where k is just one over epsilon. And the decomposition theorem again said that there exists a part partition of opt into k thin components such that we can lower bound the sum of the weights of the drops by 1 minus epsilon times the weight of u. Um, in order to show this, um, we will actually show like the following statement. This is just like slightly rephrasing the statement. So what we want to do is we want to se select like a small subset of, of these uplinks in U. This makes, just up, makes up just an epsilon fraction of the total weight that we are going to ignore and we'll just leave them sort of uncovered. And then we want to construct a partition of opt into these case then components such that all the uplinks in U, except those few links that 
are contained in the set R here, they should be covered, meaning they should be contained in one of the drop sets of the components. So we are allowed to pick an epsilon fraction in terms of weight of these uplinks. We are allowed to basically ignore them. And for all the other uplinks, um, they should be contained in one of the drop sets of the components. So that's our goal. I want to always show that such a partition always exists. And so here is uh, the outline of our proof. So what we do is actually, as a very first step, um, we fix the potential way of how we could cover a single uplink in U. So I look at the single, I look at every uplink in U, for example, this blue one here. And now I want to find a subset of the links in up. For example, these orange one here, they that together cover this uplink, uh, this path PU here. Uh, so what this really means is that if, if I ensure that all the links in FU um, are part of the same component, then this would imply that U is part of the drop set of this component. So basically what I do here is I say, well, suppose I want to really make sure that U is part of one of the drop sets, then I will do this by ensuring that all the links in FU are part of the same component. That's the purpose of selecting this covering here. And let me draw like this in a, from a slightly different perspective. So here in this picture on the right, um, all these circles, uh, they correspond to the elements of opt and FU is just a subset of these links. And of course, I just don't pick just such a covering of U just for a single uplink, but I really do this for all the uplinks in U. So this is step one. And then once I fix such a covering, so a potential way of, of covering um, this path PU um, for every uplink, in the second step, I will select the set R of links that I uplinks that I'm gonna ignore. So here in this example, for example, R might be just a set containing this green uplink U3. This essentially means in the following, I'm gonna ignore U3, so I can ignore this, this green set of U here. And then only in the last step, I actually compute this partition of opt into components. And remember that in order to make sure that all the uplinks in U without R are contained in one of the drop sets, I want to make sure that for, for each of these uplinks in U without O, there is one component that contains all the elements of a view. So this means here in this picture, all the elements of this red set here should be part of a single component. All the elements of the blue sets should be part of a single component. And also all the elements of this orange set here should be part of a single component. But that, if you think about this now for a little moment, that actually means it is kind of clear how we should choose these components. Like actually there's only like really one reasonable choice, namely in this picture, we should pick, take all these, all these elements here, all these points on the left here into one component and all these points here on the right. So really what these components should be, they should just be the connected components of this kind of hypergraph that I draw here on the right. This is like the only reasonable way of choosing components. So really the challenge in this proof here is to make sure that we make these choices that we make in step one and step two. So choosing these coverings and selecting the set out of uncovered links in such a way that the components that result in step three in a sort of automatic way that they are okay thin. Because that is really what we what would be required in the end, that you obtain k thin components. But like really like the difficulty lies in making the right choices in step one and step two. And then the, the components they just result automatically. And so the key idea of this or the key the main key thing that we do in this proof is we will we again like build some kind of auxiliary graph somehow similar to the one on the, to this picture here on the right, where the connected components of this auxiliary graph correspond to the components that we want to obtain in the end. Um, and the nice, like the key part of the proof is that we are able to show that we can construct this auxiliary graph 
in such a way that we can relate properties of this auxiliary graph to the thinness of these resulting components in the end. So this is um, like uh, what happens at the height of the proof in the end. Uh, you'll let me say a few more words about this, but this is like really the key idea. So basically the way we build this auxiliary graph is um, we are going to choose these coverings of u here, not just as an arbitrary uh, covering of this path pu, but an inclusion with minimal one. Um, actually, we'll add some more properties later on. If you have such a minimal covering, uh, one can show that these, or one can kind of see that in the picture here already, that these links in this covering sort of have a somewhat natural order um, here in this covering. So L1 covers sort of the topmost part of U, then L2 covers the middle part, and L3 covers the bottommost part. And we express this um, by such a directed path here with vertex set um, of U. So the vertex set of this corresponds to the covering. But now we don't use these hyper edges as in the previous picture, but we represent this covering here by a directed path. Um, and then already, like, like we consider this auxiliary graph, which we call the dependency graph. This is just the graph that we obtain by taking uh, this graph as vertex set opt, like the graph on the right in the picture in the previous slide. And the arc set of this graph is just the union of the disjoint union of all these paths AU for all the uplinks in U. And again, think of the connected components of this graph as corresponding to the components we want to obtain in the end. And now Cohen and Utaf already showed, they made this very nice observation that this dependency graph is always going to be a branching. So this means every connected component is an aborescence. Like, so the picture could look like, like this here. Um, so this could be the dependency graph. And here, think of these different colors are just a different path AU. So every different color here corresponds to one of these coverings of U uh, corresponding to one of the uplinks in our set U here. And this is always going to be such a branching, uh, which is a very nice property. And then, so this was already shown by Cohen and Nutov. And one thing that we sh could show now in our paper is that if we choose like these coverings of U in a very careful way, so we do not all, only choose them as an inclusion with minimal covering, but with some additional property, then we can relate properties of this dependency graph to the thinness of the components, connected components. Precisely, we could show that if every path in the dependency graph intersects at most k minus one of these sets AU, so this means along every path in the dependency graph, we have at most k minus one different colors in this picture, then every connected component corresponds to a k-thin set. So we get this thinness property. So in this example, if you look at any path here like this one, you will see at most three different colors along every path. And this implies that every connected component corresponds to a force thin link set. And so I don't have the time to show you why this holds. But essentially, if we have this property, we almost immediately get the decomposition theorem. Namely, what we can do in order to get this, we now still need to discuss how we select the set O of uplinks that we want to leave uncolored. We can just look at every connected component of this dependency graph and label these paths here, starting with label 0 at the root, label 1, label 2, and so on, such that at, along every path, the labels appearing there are just like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And then what we simply do is, uh, starting at some random offset, we just delete every case uh, path, essentially. And these deleted paths just correspond to these uplinks that we are ignoring here. And by the property on the previous slide, this essentially immediately gives us that the resulting components are case then. And because of this random sampling, every path gets removed uh, with probability at most 1 over k which is essentially epsilon. So this is, yeah, roughly how we get this 
uh, decomposition theorem here. So these, the, 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 the paths that we delete here really just correspond to these uplinks uh, that we that we'll even covered and put into the set R here. So this was just like a very brief uh, sketch of what happens roughly in the proof of uh, this decomposition theorem. Uh, so let me now like, uh, yeah, come to like a brief summary and some open questions I would like to mention. So in this talk, I've shown you two better than two approximations for greater tree augmentation. The first one was this relative greedy algorithm that has an approximation ratio of roughly 1.69. And the second one was this local surge algorithm that achieves an approximation ratio of 3 half plus epsilon. A few open questions I would like to mention here is like one interesting direction is to try to generalize um, this algorithm uh, to these algorithms to generalizations of weighted tree augmentation. So there are several interesting ones for which currently a true approximation is the best known approximation ratio, but nothing better than two is known. So one such problem would be the weighted connectivity augmentation problem. So this is the problem where we have, a, like in weighted tree augmentation, I told you we have a connected graph and want to make it two edge connected by adding some links. And in connectivity augmentation, we have a k edge connected graph and want to make this k plus one edge connected by adding some links. And again, we can look at the weighted version. And there, uh, for the unweighted setting, uh, basically one can transfer all the techniques for the um, best known algorithm for unweighted tree augmentation also. And do the same also for weighted, uh, uh, for unweighted connectivity augmentation. But for weighted connectivity augmentation, so for no better than two approximation is known. And this would be very interesting to see if we can generalize the techniques to this setting. Another interesting generalization of weighted tree augmentation is the minimum weight tree edge connected spanning subgraph problem. And um, also there, a true approximation is known, but nothing better. Uh, then another interesting direction is what about LP relaxation? So can we prove a better bound, upper bound than two on the integrality gap of the natural LP relaxation? Or can we even come up with any kind of natural LP relaxation for which we can show an integrality gap better than two? So for example, like in the, in like one related problem is the standard tree problem. And actually one can show that this local search approach can also be applied to the standard tree problem, uh, where we can recover the currently best known approximation ratio of LN4 plus epsilon, which was first shown by Birker, Guandoni, Rotfuss, and Sanita. And in the standard tree problem, one can write some kind of hypergraphic LP relaxation. So where we have variables corresponding to components, but it's not clear whether we can do a similar thing for weighted tree augmentation. So really getting any kind of natural LP relaxation with an integrality gap better than two would be very interesting, I think. And then here I talked about edge connectivity. Um, so augmenting, um, uh, yeah, adding links in order to increase the edge connectivity and it would be, yeah, kind of nice to see whether we can do something uh, also for for node connectivity. So that would also be another direction in which one could try to extend these results. Uh, yes, and with this, uh, this question, I would like to conclude my talk. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for the talk and the study on behalf of everyone. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I see Cheyenne's already ready with one. So <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Thanks a lot for an excellent talk. Uh, one quick question. Uh, what about the covering, the natural covering LB? Is it known that its integrality gap is as bad as two? Or is it possible that even that has better than two integrality gap? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good question. Yeah, exactly. So natural LP, um, this could be better than two. It could be as good as we have. I think the best known lower bound that even holds for unweighted instances is a lower bound of three half. Um, but it could be possible that even this has an integrality gap better than two. So if we could show an integrality gap better than two for this, I guess this would be sort of, yeah, would be very nice. And this could well be possible. Uh, yeah, but even, yeah, 
Thanks. But even like for movie, like, yeah, less natural LPs, we don't know anything. Uh, so basically, there's no really into, yeah, LP relaxation for which we know any bit about than, than two. But even it could be even for the most simple one. That could be that's better than two. So for the, for, for the unweighted geometric mutation problem, we know that the simple LP has an integrality gap better than two, but for the weighted one, we don't know. But it could be possible. Thank you, Thank you Sean. Um, do we have any other question? I see no one typing. And um, okay, so then if not, let's thank Vera again. Thank you, Vera, for a very nice talk. Thanks. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.